continue with our series in the book of Acts called Acts Empowered. What we've been doing is going through uh, the book of Acts and, and hitting on some of the highlight uh, of the early church, the fact that it was launched uh, in the book of Acts as a history of the early church. It's also a transition period. If you study the background of the book of Acts from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and it's a great place for us to be studying. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we actually uh, came up with a theme for this coming year called Relaunch, 20 years of ministry just uh, prior, a couple weeks ago. And looking at this coming year, we were looking at if we were to start the church over again, what would we emphasize, what would we do differently? Now, we can't cancel a number of ministries, uh, but God seemed to do that for us in a weird way. Uh, and one of the ideas was simplifying and, and breaking our church down into more manageable uh, opportunities for Bible study and prayer. Isn't it ironic how God kind of just forced this on us if we want to take it from that perspective? So, uh, but looking at uh, the book of Acts and studying these different uh, portions of Scripture, I came up with an acrostic to help us go through the book of Acts, and it's from the word Acts itself. A stands for ascension, C stands for church, T stands for transition and trinity, and then the letter S stands for salvation. Well, today's message will hit on a couple of those uh, points as we go through this. And as I've mentioned this in previous lessons in the past, uh, that, that uh, acrostic there, Acts, will be what we're hitting on, either one or two or all of those points in these messages as we go through. So here we're looking at a time in the early church history where the church is now under persecution. They're being scattered abroad and taking the gospel with them, as every Christian ought to do while they're scattered away uh, from their main church. And so uh, as we get into this in Acts chapter 8, we already read verses 5 through 10. So I won't go back and reread all this at this time. But we'll be working our way through this passage up to verse 25, getting through that here uh, today. Uh, let me just take a moment and thank also uh, Daniel and Emily. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you're translating these messages into ASL for our folks that uh, are hearing impaired and uh, appreciate that. Again, I, I can go on to just say how many people work behind the scenes or have other ministries through this church. I'm so thankful for you. Thank, thankful to you for your faithful giving. Uh, we praise God that our giving has been up and you have just been sustaining this work as we move forward and uh, looking forward to sharing some blessings with you in the near future here as we get, have opportunities to communicate this way or hopefully in some time to come being back together, uh, which will be probably a slow getting back together. But we'll, we'll talk about that at another meeting. And so I mentioned this phrase last week, the church scattered does matter. And no doubt, even this week, hearing of some of you speaking of opportunities to uh, talk to others about your faith, being able to communicate with people, uh, keep it up. Uh, that's a, a great opportunity for us at this time to be able to talk to friends, loved ones, strangers, whomever, and uh, continue to just work on those relationships to present the gospel to people because that's what will change eternal lives. The temporal life is going to go, we know that. But eternal life is where it's at. And so we want to make sure we're helping people to come to that knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Well, when the church is scattered, it takes the message with, with them as what we're learning from this uh, text. To give you just a little background here, uh, persecution, vacation, job change, military deployment or moves, or a pandemic are all ways in which the church can be scattered. In our text... The church was being scattered because of persecution and vicious persecution by a man named Saul. Saul was a Jew. Uh, he had such a zeal and a passion for what he believed at the time was right, a passion for God. And yet he did not believe in Jesus Christ. He did not believe Jesus was the true Messiah. And therefore he asked permission to go and persecute Christians uh, as the Jewish leaders of the time gave him the permission to go ahead and do that. We just saw in the last chapter, chapter 7, into chapter 8, where Stephen was put to death for his faith in a cruel way by stoning. And, and so we have Peter, or excuse me, Philip and Stephen who were friends. Philip and Stephen served in the Jerusalem church together. They were partners in ministry together. Philip fled and went to, towards Samaria. And this is where we find him. We find him ministering in Samaria, and God has empowered him greatly to do a work there. Now, 
Don't get confused with this Philip. There are several Philips in the scriptures. This is not Philip the apostle. This is Philip, what we would call a deacon or a servant, served alongside of uh, six other men that were chosen in Acts chapter number 6. And so he was used of God. And this gives any of you out there uh, the understanding that, boy, if God could use a man like Philip who wasn't an apostle, he wasn't a pastor, if God could use Philip to do the work of God, could he not use me? Could he not use you? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. If you're willing and you ask God to empower you to do his work, you truly know him as your savior, you can do great works for God. Now, we look at this time, it was a transitional time. There were great miracles being performed. There were other authenticating gifts that we believe have died off with the apostles. Now, it does not mean that God can, cannot still heal, that God cannot still do certain miracles, but we don't see it as they did back in those early days. And I can't go back and reteach the old messages. Go back and study that for yourselves. But we do know that at this particular time, God was using signs and miracles in order to authenticate the message of Jesus Christ's resurrection and the need to trust Jesus as their personal Savior. Today, we have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit of God that does the convicting. And so, as we pick it up here, we note that Christians are fleeing. Jewish Christians are fleeing to other places. And of all places for Philip to go was a place called Samaria. Now, why would I say it that way? Well, Samaria and uh, the Jews from Jerusalem did not see eye to eye. And I would say even more so, there was a hatred, a genuine hatred of these two people groups. The Samaritans made up uh, former Jews who were dispersed uh, many years prior to this, but they also now intermarried with Gentiles. And so this was a, uh, a prejudice that, was a, that they each had. Not only that, but the Samaritans went back to Joshua's day where Joshua worshipped from Shechem, from, from that location, or Mount Gerizim. And we know that they held to that place, that they were to worship there, where the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem, where the first temple was built. And so there were just underlying issues that these two people groups had one against another. And yet this is exactly where God sent Philip. I have to reflect back in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, where... Uh, Jesus told the apostles to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit of God who would empower them to be witnesses where? Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Now I wonder if that time they were thinking, no, not so, this can't be true. We can't go to Samaria. We don't like the Samaritans. They're, they're not our type of people. And it's interesting how God chose people who would have to overcome their personal prejudices in order to preach the gospel to the whole world. And here we're seeing the entrance of the gospel moving into a place that they would not have chosen to go, perhaps unless persecution came and forced them to go to this location. So with that being said, we have this background. Uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with this new TV movie series called The Chosen. Uh, I watch this with my family, and I have to just tell you, it's one of the best depictions that I personally, my opinion, I've seen on the life of Christ, and I can't wait for the new seasons to come out, uh, but it's something that you have to join up online and follow along. But uh, the last scene of the last series, or the last part of this first series, was uh, the woman at the well Jesus met, and she became a believer. She runs off down in towards Samaria, and Jesus and the disciples meet back up, and now they start walking together. And Peter said to Jesus, is it time? Is it time? And Jesus said, it is. And they start walking. With the, the, most, the, the hilarious thing of this was the song that starts playing, which I had to just laugh. It was kind of a rocky song, but uh, it, just, it said the word trouble in it, and just that kind of low tone, trouble. And as they start walking towards Samaria, and you just realize... What an amazing thing that there was getting ready to happen with Jesus taking the disciples towards Samaria and the interactions they would have there and the disciples' personal prejudice with going into a town that would uh, be, be filled with people that they did not care for. The gospel has a way of breaking through every barrier, folks. Whether it's race or ethnicity or some other background, Jesus Christ came for everybody. And what a blessing that he came for you and that he came for me. And such a blessing that we can study the portion of scripture here and find out how God was at work in this early church. And so what can we learn from this? Well, we can learn that God 
used a man named Philip to do some miraculous works. It wasn't Philip doing the works, it was God doing the works. He was the messenger. But yet he has interactions with several people that we're going to bring to light here. One is Simon the Sorcerer, we're going to study here today. Next week we'll look at the Ethiopian eunuch. And, and I'll be talking about the contrast between those two. What a, what a difference in their approach and how they came to making a profession of faith. One, I believe, was a false faith. One was a genuine faith. And we're going to talk about the false faith today of Simon the Sorcerer. The false faith of Simon the Sorcerer. And so uh, another title I've given to this message was Confession is Not Always True Profession. Confession is not always true profession. Sometimes people make a decision to follow along or to go along with religion, not because they truly believe it, but there was something else that was behind their receiving or joining with a religious group. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives a parable on the tares in which he describes different types of soil and how the seed grows in those soils. And what we can find by studying that portion of Scripture, there was only one soil that produced fruit and remained. And it seems to be that's the one, uh, the, the illustration there is given to a, a, a soul that truly does understand the truth of the message, truly is converted to Christ and now bears fruit in their life. But how many times have we heard of Christians? How many times have you met Christians that they say they're Christian, but there is no demonstration of the Spirit of God in their life. There's no desire for the things of God. They're just religious and there's a difference. And we need to check our own selves. This is not a judgmental message against you, the listeners. This is a self-inspection. Are you a true believer or are you just going along because it's the easy thing to do? It's the family heritage. It's, it's something that you're, you're, you like the people who you're related to or, or fellowship with amongst Christianity. Make sure your faith is real in Jesus Christ alone. And so we look then at the identity of Simon. Who is this man and what do we know about this man? And I think it's interesting to note that there is some historical uh, persons that have written about Simon. Justin the Martyr makes mention of Simon, but Irenaeus makes mention of Simon as well and uh, gives some interesting historical background. Irenaeus, an early church father in his work against heresies, writes of Simon of Samaria from whom all sorts of heresies derive their origin. That was his statement about this Simon that we're studying right here. He goes on to say, uh, Thus then, the mystic priests belonged to the sect that both led profligate lives and practiced magical arts, each one to the extent of his ability. They used exorcisms and incantations, love potions too, and charms, as well as those beings are called uh, peridry or familiar spirits is what the idea is there, or dream senders, there's certain words that they are associated with sorcery. Whatever other curious arts can, can be had uh, recourse to, are eagerly pressed into their service. They also have an image of Simon fashioned after their likeness of Jupiter and another of Helena in the shape of Minerva. And these they worship. And so this, this was a man who had a great following because of his sorcery. What was his sorcery? Well, we find that word in the scriptures in a number of places. Uh, basically, he was a magician. He was sleight of hand, but yet he may have also been Powered by Satan. We know that Satan can work lies and wonders, even in our day and age. He can make something seem real. He can do things. He can perform certain types of supernatural feats. And sometimes he does use individuals in his service. And perhaps Simon was one of those that he used because he had such a great grasp of how to seduce and to uh, gain people following him. And he did it for money. The term simony. Some of you may have heard of that term, is the idea of using uh, religion to profit for yourself, to make money off of religion in order for you to build up and to uh, make a name for yourself in order for you to make uh, lots of money. And so this was something associated with this man, Simon, the sorcerer. But we want to go back and, and uh, teach on Simon in just a moment and his coming of faith. But I just want to also make mention before we get into this, the danger of blind faith. The danger of blind faith. It would be easy for me as a pastor to be able to say, just trust me. 
Just believe what I tell you. And I have learned from a young man and growing up into college and seminary and, and then pastoring, I find a great danger in people just trusting whatever the guy up there at the front or the lady up there in the front, the priest, the priestess, the pastor. It doesn't matter who the religious leader is. Yes, there's a trust level there, but you should only truly trust the Word of God and the Spirit of God. You can always take what man says, and then let's go back to the Scripture and see if what that man says matches up with the Scripture. That is a good test to keep us as pastors accountable. That's a good test for you to grow in your own personal faith, to always go back to the Scriptures to see if what that person is saying is true, whether it's a fellow Christian, someone counseling you, someone helping you. Go back to the Scriptures because God left us His Word, preserved it for us so we would know whether or not someone is speaking the truth or a lie. It's so important that you're in tune with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. But the danger of blind faith, Satan has had a plan from the beginning to change the message of God into a lie. Did we not see that in the Garden of Eden? He made Eve question, then even boldly stated against what God said clearly to Eve, thus leading her into deception. Satan is still at his work today. I said this last week. Over 1,600 different Christian sects of religion. 1,600 over that. Can you imagine if we could go back to this early church? There was no name associated with it other than Jesus' church. His, my church, if we would, from Matthew 16. And yet today we have denomination after denomination, even quote-unquote non-denominational churches that are a denomination of themselves. Listen, folks, we have muddied the waters so much because someone had a disagreement over this, or someone had a disagreement over that, or yes, they started teaching error doctrine, and so they created a following. But wow, have we come a long way since this early church that we're studying right here. And there are core doctrines that we can't change on. But sadly, even today, we have good people. We have Christians that are separating from other Christians over a taste in music, over a version. Now listen, this is a controversial issue in our day. But they'll separate over a version of Scripture which does not pertain to salvation, but it pertains to the teaching of the Word of God. They'll separate over dress standard. They'll separate over a style of building. They'll separate over whether or not a church should, uh, what they should do with their finances. There are so many ways that we have come up with divisions in our churches. Now think about this. Who's behind that? Is God behind divisions? Now you say, well, bless God, we're taking a stand on what we believe is right. Okay. But could it have been handled a different way? If it's not teaching false doctrine, thus saith the Lord doctrine, if it's not teaching something different, uh, an error teaching of salvation, are these separations necessary? When we study the scriptures, you'll find there were some big arguments between the apostles. And what happened? They settled them. They dealt with it. They asked God to intervene, and they figured out a way to fix those issues. But we also know there were some that had to be kicked out of the church. And a lot of those started the isms and schisms and, and cults of the day. So it's not a perfect answer. But I think we as Christians need to really be thoughtful about how we interact with one another. And so I'm going to say some things today that might seem harsh. I don't mean it that way. But I also want you to understand that this is so important that we understand what does the Scripture say, not just what does this guy say or some church leader say. So with that in mind, Satan is out to deceive us. The early church had no denominational affiliation. It was Jesus' church. Now today we have numerous denominations and we have numerous cults and isms and schisms. Many people today call things Christian but they really are not rooted in Christian doctrine solely. And I think this is one of the deception of Satan. He can give us 98% truth, but then he can water down something so precious as the gospel. Paul said in Galatians, Who hath bewitched you to believe a lie in reference to the gospel? Here were Judaizers coming back in and saying, Well, it's nice that Paul taught you about salvation by faith, but we also think you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to do this. That is so prevalent in many Christian churches today that we have to be on guard. We need to understand what was the apostles' doctrine, what was Jesus' doctrine, and not fall prey to this. The Mormon church, the Church of Latter-day Saints today, teaches 
about Jesus, very similar to what Simon taught. He believes that, that the, uh, the, the idea of the, of the Mormon church not truly believing that Jesus Christ is God alone. That's, that's dangerous. If you take Jesus Christ from being God alone, then you no longer have a Savior. We also can go to the Jehovah's Witness Church and uh, the Watchtower Association. We understand false teaching comes from there. We can go to many churches that teach salvation by faith in Jesus, but you also must be baptized. There are many denominations, Christian denominations, mainline Christian denominations that adhere to that, and yet that's not what the Scriptures teach. Salvation has always been sola fide, or faith alone in Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a profession of your faith outwardly, publicly, but it is not what uh, you must have to be saved. The thief on the cross, a great example. No opportunity to get baptized, no opportunity to do good works. It was faith alone in Jesus' finished work that uh, solidified his salvation. And so we must understand, when we study scriptures, we'll come to the same conclusions if we study it with the right heart. And so with that being said, we come now to a man named Simon, and he has an improper reasoning of his supposed faith. He has an improper reasoning of why he would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so let's look at this here, starting in verse number 11, because we already read up to verse number 10. And so understanding that these people believe that he was almost God-like himself. In verse number 10, I'll just go back and read this once again. In verse 9, it says he was a great one. In verse 10, it says, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. They actually promoted him up to a level because of his sorcery, because of his magic, because of maybe even being empowered by Satan to do certain things. They looked at him as almost godlike. And he took that and he used it for all it was worth because it was making him a lot of money. He had no heart for the people. He had a heart for himself. What it goes on to say in verse number 11, And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. So again, this idea of bewitching them for a long time, for a very long time, he was in their presence and he was using his tricks in order to uh, secure a crowd to follow him. And so we see that this is something that was uh, uh, the practice of his day. And here Philip shows up, and back in verse number 6, notice what it says. And the people with one accord gave heed unto these things which Philip spake. What did Philip speak? He spoke the wonderful, precious salvation through Jesus Christ alone. He preached the gospel that he heard. He was full of the Holy Spirit, and he went there and he preached. And here it goes on to say, in order to authenticate that he was speaking a true message at this time, God used miraculous works. And notice in verse number 7, Unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out, and many that were possessed with them, and many that were taken with palsies, different types of sicknesses, and lame were healed, and there was great joy. You can imagine. Here, they've had this charlatan Simon there performing trickery and stuff, and what happens sometimes with these fake magicians, even fake Christian religious leaders is they may say they perform miracles, but if you follow that person around, you'll find out that wasn't true. And maybe some of these people for a long time, some were suppressed to, to be quiet, but some really knew the truth about this man. But then when they saw the real power of God at work, they saw that God was using, uh, God was, Philip was preaching and God was there in his power healing people and those possessed with demons were being healed and in their right mind, they saw how real it was. And not only that, but the Spirit of God was speaking to their hearts and they had great joy. You know what a blessing it is when you see someone come to faith in Christ? There's a joy in them that you, you can't give them. There's, for, for those of you that have trusted Christ, you're saved. You know what I'm talking about. The day that you got saved, man, something inside changed and you just had this, this joy, you had this desire to just... You don't even know what you could do, but you just want to say, man, praise God. And that's the joy that God gives because you know that you've been clean from the inside out. You know you have a new relationship with Jesus Christ. Simon could not offer that. He offered traps. 
He offered trickery. He offered, you got to give me more money. you got to do this. you got to do this. He kept them in bondage. What a difference in Jesus coming into a life and changing them, giving them liberty, than a man who will come and put you in more bondage and more bondage and always want more from you. And so this is a tremendous uh, contrast here between God and his work and Simon and his trickery. And so we find then with Simon, what was the reasoning? Simon wanted to follow now Philip and this Jesus. Notice what it says here, verse number 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, in other words, the gospel pertaining to the kingdom, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So these people not only made a profession of trusting Jesus, but then they also followed the Lord and believers' baptism. This was like, these are real disciples. Yes, we're in. We want to follow this Jesus. Then notice what it says in verse number 13. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the, the miracles and signs which were done, now when the apostles which were Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. All right, a couple things to make mention here. One, Simon saw the miracles and he said, okay, this is different than any trick I've ever pulled. <laughs> These people are getting cured. These people are, are getting the real deal. These people are being freed from the, the, the demons that perhaps even he helped possess them with. I don't know how that all worked, but yet we understand the power of God was healing. And here we find that he's curious enough to make a profession of faith and to get baptized. Folks, I've been at this church ministry for 30 years now. I have seen many people make professions of faith. I've personally led them to a, to a prayer where they say, yes, I want to trust Christ. And, and sadly, in some cases, I've, I've never seen them walk with God. I've never seen them follow through. I've never seen them do much. I've seen some come, get baptized, stay with us for a little while. Then I've seen them walk away and live a life that is totally, totally like it was prior to them making that profession of faith. I'm not a judge of a person's heart. But what I do know is when God comes into a heart and they truly do believe, their life changes. They desire the things of God. They don't walk away permanently. They stay close to God. Now, that doesn't mean they're perfect. They may wander in certain areas. But there's always that desire to get right with God. There's always that desire to, to live for God. And what we find is that they'll bear fruit in their life, spiritual fruit, the Bible speaks of. And so... I can't judge souls, but I do know that Simon seems to fit the same category as people that I've seen walk away from the faith. And it's a sad thing to see because you would think, well, he, got, he made a profession, he got baptized, of course he's saved. Only God will know that. He only knows the hearts of man. And so it's for, up to us to do a self-inspection because so many, so many churches that preach the truth and so many places have many people who are followers but they might not be following for the right reasons. And that's what we find with Simon. Why would it be that Simon would want to follow along Philip? Well, Simon was full of his own pride, self-pride. Why? Because pride can convince yourself to believe your own lies. I don't know about you, but have you ever said a lie long enough? Where you actually believe your own lie? Maybe years went by and you made a lie long ago, but then after a while you're like, I guess that did really happen. It's interesting that sometimes your own pride can get you to believe your own false story. Can, pride can cause you to use what is holy for unholy desires. I've seen people use God's work for themselves. I've seen people use others to get what they want for selfish, fleshly desires. I've seen people use God's people in a way that brings them accolades and it brings them uh, the pleasures of the flesh and they've used and abused people for that purpose, that's not a person who has a true heart for God. But pride can get in the way of us living a life that honors God. Pride can also cause you to distort truth in your own favor. Can distort truth in your own favor. How many times have we heard people preaching the word of God and somehow injecting themselves in the story or getting people to believe that that was talking about them? These are false teachers, false uh, 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 speakers of, of what should be truth in the scriptures. Pride can cause you to not see your own demise. 
You, sometimes you look at me and say, can you not see the road you're heading down is leading to destruction? Ah, leave it. That's not true. You just think the worst. You're always negative. You're so judgmental. And before you know it, they face the end. Pride can also keep you from submitting to God's own words. You can be so filled with your own pride that you say, that Bible, it's a bunch of heresy. It's a bunch of uh, just stories, a bunch of fables. And who's deceiving whom? Perhaps Satan has got you right where he wants you. You're so educated, you can't believe the truth. You've been so hurt in church that you will never give God another chance. Don't let pride deceive yourself. I know many people have been hurt from pastors and fellow church members and religious leaders, but yet don't throw God out. They were bad people. But you will answer to God yourself someday. Can't use it for an excuse for your whole life. And so we see that Simon had a proud heart. His reasoning was probably more along the lines of, what can I use this power to do for myself? That was his life, using people to make himself rich. Secondly, we see about Simon that his salvation was really for personal gain. He wasn't isn't in it for the truth. Look at verse number 17. It says, Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Isn't that crazy? He offered them money. Give me this power. I want to know how to have that power. Man, I've been doing this for years, and my, I did it all through tricks. You guys really did it. Give me that. I'll, I'll pay you to give me that kind of power. He was not in it. Salvation to him was, okay, I have to do what to become a, a member? I have to do what to be a follower of Jesus? And if I do this, I'll be able to get these powers? Okay, yeah, I'll pray this prayer. Okay, I'll get, bab I'll get baptized. Wow. Not a true profession. A false profession. But yet he was so in it. He was so used to being in power. He was so used to making money. That's how he viewed this idea of making a profession of faith was to gain more power for himself. It wasn't genuine salvation. It was for personal gain. Thirdly, he saw the Spirit of God is for personal gain. Again, going back to verse number 19, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, that might sound like spiritual talk, but he was not in it for other people. He was in it for himself. But he was using Christian talk. Give me this power so I can help other people also get the Holy Ghost. Well, that sounds wonderful, but he was just willing to pay for it. And we know his heart. He wanted to heap treasures on himself. And, and we're kind of, we kind of know the end of the story, so that's why we can be a little more confident in saying this. But I want you to notice also one more thing. His sinful heart will perish without true repentance. His sinful heart will perish as will ours, if we truly do not understand that we're sinners and we cry out to Jesus Christ, who is God, who paid the full price for my sins. Set my pride aside. Yes, Jesus, you are the one and only true God. You are the one who died in my place. And I trust you and you alone. If that's not a sincere prayer of your heart, then there is no hope for you. There's no hope for you. We must understand this was the heart of Simon. Now let me just make a couple statements here, verse, going back to verse number uh, 14. When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, or in other words, had received the gospel, then sent they Peter and John. Well, why Peter and John? Well, Peter and John were a team. They were two of the apostles from Jerusalem. Remember, the Jerusalem church did not want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. The Samarians. Even though Jesus told them they would be uh, witnesses for him in Samaria, I think they were still struggling with a personal prejudice. Why would anyone go to Samaria? If we're going there, let's let them be the last people we go talk to. But yet, because of the church being scattered, Philip went there and souls started coming to Christ, genuinely converted to Jesus Christ. When they heard about this, they said, somebody needs to go find out if this is true. So who do we send? We send Peter and John, two of the, the well-known uh, leaders at that time of the apostles. So Peter and John show up. And we know that there was a delay in receiving the Holy Spirit because of authentication. Now, if you go back and study this, you'll have to understand. The Holy Spirit of God 
on the day of Pentecost was uh, empowered them, but they spoke in different languages, not unknown tongues. They spoke in known languages, and the people heard them, heard the gospel in their tongue, and couldn't believe it, and they received Jesus Christ their Savior. We see this, is hap this will happen three or four times in the book of Acts, and it's the way God chose to authenticate to the Jews, who were the first in the church, and the apostles, who were the first in the church, that the Jews would receive the gospel first, but then they would be called to spread that gospel throughout the known world. Samaria being one of those choking points for them. Really? The, Samaritan, the Samarians are now going to get the gospel? And so they sent them to authenticate this, but they did not receive the Holy Spirit. We know today we receive, we receive the Holy Spirit of God the moment you ask Jesus Christ to, re, to become your Savior. Here we see that the delay was a divine delay. And this will happen again in the scriptures. We'll point it out Acts 10, Acts chapter 19. We see two more times where that happened. But here we see the delay in them receiving the Holy Spirit. And so when Simon saw this, that's what moved him to want that kind of power. But what we see here by this delay it was to authenticate that these people, these Gent or these Sumerians, these half-breeds, were also receiving the truth and they were, were receiving um, the power the uh, Holy Spirit. And so when Peter and John went back to report Jerusalem and say, hey guys, yeah, they got it too. Un, un, we can't believe it. But yes, God is even having mercy on the, Samar the Samarians. And so this was another sign of authentication that they were seeing God's hand at work spreading throughout the known world in, in certain fashion. And so this is an amazing opportunity for them to be a part of Next, I want you to see as we get close to the to finish up here, what are some reasons, like Simon, people will make a profession of faith and join a church? Well, sometimes we see people join a church to, have a, to, to, to be a part of a certain denomination because that denomination in their community might have a good name. We see sometimes that people will join a church in order to honor their parents or their grandparents. They really don't have a desire for church. They don't have a desire for God, but hey, this is our family heritage. Might as well be a member of this particular church. We also find that people join a church to look good for personal gain. Well, everyone in my community, you know, they say this is the biggest church. If you go to this church, you'll have the most inroads for business. So let's join up with that church. And they go for other reasons of personal gain. Some people join a church because they're going to get married. And even though sometimes the people have no faith of their own, they'll join a church in order to have their wedding in that church because that's the bride's church or the groom's church and they want to make sure they can have that wedding in that church. And again, uh, for our church, we, we won't do any wedding unless we know for sure that you have a testimony of salvation. Uh, we, we don't want to participate in, in a service where someone is just using the church for a holy ceremony in order to just uh, uh, get their way. This is, this is dangerous that we allow people to join churches without knowing truly they've trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And then some join churches just to be accepted. For whatever reason that is, they join it because, well, that's where my friends go, that's who I know, and so they'll join a church for that reason. Now listen, joining a church doesn't save a soul. The Baptist church can't get you to heaven. The Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, doesn't matter what church you, you claim, cannot get you to heaven. Jesus alone, faith in Jesus' finished work alone is what we must believe in order for our sins to be forgiven and for us to go to heaven. So what did Peter say to Simon that shows us Peter, an apostle, endued with the power of God, knowing Simon at that particular day, here's what the apostle Peter said to him, which gives us more credibility of why we believe Simon truly wasn't a genuine professing Christian. Verse 22, Repent ye therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart be forgiven thee. Here's Simon, after he offered them money because he wanted that same power, Simon or Peter said in verse 21, You have no part in this at all. You could almost hear the, the uh, egregious heart of the Apostle Peter as he looks at Simon, he goes, you have nothing to do with this. You, you don't even understand what you're asking. And he says, and unless you repent, meaning you change course, you do a direct turnaround, you are trying to just add this to your 
own repertoire of things that you can do to use people. He said, unless you repent of that and you truly do trust Jesus, you have no part in this at all. And pray that God will forgive you. That's what he said. Pray that God will forgive you of that. Next we see also in verse number 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Peter just laid a line. He goes, listen, Simon, sorcerer, you are in bitterness. You don't even see how bad of a place you're in right now. And he said, you're still in iniquity. There's been no forgiveness granted to you because this is all about what you can get out of it. Peter didn't mix words here. He, he gave it to him straight. He made sure he knew that, that this was not the way to come to faith in Christ. It was by trying to use God for his own purposes. And then what we see here, uh, lastly, in verse number 24, he says, Then answered Simon, and he said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Verse 25, And they when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And so what we find here is that the, uh, Peter's words to Simon indicated that he did not believe that he truly professed faith in Jesus Christ. Now, he was an apostle. He was, he was someone that was, God was using uh, at, a, a, at a particular time. But we also see here that Simon Peter seems to be just trying to add to his own uh, merits, to his own abilities to have this power to use it. And so we don't believe that he was a true believer. Some concluding thoughts. Simon was in it for personal gain. And there are many today who are searching, but not like Simon. You truly want to believe. Only the Holy Spirit of God can convince you of the truth of salvation. I cannot. I can give you my best presentation of the gospel, and you may hear that and say, okay, next. But if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, and He's taking His Word, and He's convincing you in your heart, and convicting you of your sin, that's the first thing that I remember sensing. I felt so guilty for my sins. And I, not, not naming every sin specifically, just, man, I just knew that something wasn't right. And I knew that God was true and Jesus Christ was truly who he claimed to be. I knew he rose from the dead. He was, he was uh, crucified and rose from the dead to pay for my sins. And it was at that moment I said, Jesus, I need you. It wasn't my religion. It wasn't my practice. It was faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so what we find is that if you truly are searching today and you may have Come to faith in the way, other ways that I had defined earlier. Not true faith alone. You did it for some other reason. Today, if you sense the weight of your sins, if you desire to have a relationship with Jesus, if you truly do believe Jesus is God and He died in your place, and if you are willing to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, He will absolutely come into you and change you from the inside out. But you must be willing and do it by faith. If you would like to pray with me, I'll pray here in just a moment and ask you to pray along with me. But for those of you that are believers, for those who are Christians, don't be deceived by the lack of knowledge and the facade of religiosity that's out there. I know people in different denominations that truly know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. I was born and raised Catholic, as many of you know. But the Catholic doctrine of the church will not take me to heaven. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just telling you the truth. They believe salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, plus baptism, plus being a member of the Catholic church, plus following the sacraments. There's many things they add to it. Many other denominations will add something else. In any church, I know Baptist churches that don't preach the truth anymore. So we have... In many different religions, people who truly have come to faith, or many different Christian uh, denominations, people who truly come to faith. But we also have people that are just believing in what that guy up there teaches. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to the truth. And see if the Spirit of God would speak to you and help you to come to true faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray, and if you want to pray along with me at home for your own salvation, you can pray along with me. If you're saved, then I would pray that God keeps you from being deceived by any other false teachers that are out there. 
Father, as now we turn our hearts to you, I thank you for this opportunity to present this truth from Acts chapter number 8 and how there are many people out there that either are false professors, they're in it for their own self-gain or for one of the other reasons that I have mentioned, but there might be some that are listening today that truly do want to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. For them, you know who they are, Lord Jesus. And perhaps right now you're convincing them of this truth. And if they would pray along with me right now, not my prayer, but with their faith in you, Jesus, they could receive you as their personal Savior. And if you'd like to pray along with me a prayer simply like this, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that you are God. And I realize that you died to pay for my sin debt. I'm trusting you that you died on that cross for me. That you were buried and you rose again from the dead. And I'm putting my faith in you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins and to give me a home in heaven with you someday. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. If that was the prayer of your heart today, I would love to hear from you. If you have questions, I'd love to hear from you. But we are so thankful that we have this opportunity to preach and teach the Word of God. And, and I hope you would understand my heart. I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody, but I also want the truth to be heard. And it's so important that we go back to what the Scriptures say, not just what religion says. Thank you for joining us today.